A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, I'm Victoria Meyer, host of The Chemical Show. This week, I am delighted to have with me Neil Burns, who is the CEO of P2 Science a renewable chemistry company that spun out of some work at Yale University. Neil is well known in the industry with a lot of experience um, in surfactants and other chemical products um, and at companies including Occitano and VVF and elsewhere. Uh, Neil and I are gonna be having a great conversation today and I'm delighted to introduce you to him. Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks, Victoria, great to be here. And by the way, congrats on the show. It's been really excellent so far. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun to get this going. Sure. So Neil, a lot of people think of you as Mr. Surfactants. You are really well known in the surfactants industry, both from your time at Occitano and VVF. And then of course, over the last number of years um, with the ICIS Surfactants Conference. Mm -hmm. How did you get started in this space? Great question. I've been thinking about this a bit recently. Um, my first exposure to surfactants was actually in my first job out of college, which was back in the early 80s uh, in England. Uh, I was working for a pigment company, a company called Manox, it no longer exists, and they had one product, Iron Blue Pigment or Pigment <laughs> Blue Number 27. And we sold it into applications like paints and inks and cosmetics. And one of the key properties of the pigment was its ability to be able to disperse in a variety of media, and then in those media maintain a fine and even dispersion. And so especially in printing inks, you know, you were looking for a, an easy dispersion and then a gloss, um, which was a function of the fineness of the dispersion in the final application. And so the way to achieve that with, um, you know, the, the addition of an inorganic pigment to organic media like paints and inks was via, guess what, surfactants. And, ah. you know, really up until that point, coming out of college, I don't remember studying, honestly, a lot about surfactants. In fact, to right. be frank, I don't remember studying anything specifically about surfactants in my, uh, in my college days. And so getting into this industrial area and, and looking at, you know, here's this this magic compound, right? Which right. you added just a few percent in, in this enormous batch of ink or paint or whatever it is. And incredibly, the properties are, are transformed. You know, um, it, it was really eye-opening, right? The, the, the whole area of paints and inks, coatings in general, and cosmetics without surfactants, it's like horrible, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's hard to imagine, <laughs> right? Hard to imagine because, you know, you're trying to get, again, this inorganic pigment into organic media. So helping unlike things, and this goes now to what I teach in my course. We do a little course uh, sometimes in conjunction with the conferences. You know, helping unlike things go together is what surfactants do. And I just remember being amazed. It's like, wow, this stuff is incredible. We don't need much of it. We only buy a little bit, but it's so critical. And so I, um, it was a small company. So although I was in R&D, there's only 50 people worked there. So in the whole company. So although I was in R&D, you know, I got to play in all sorts of different areas. So I got to know the, the vendors of surfactants very well. Because I'm thinking, wow, these guys are like so important <laughs> in terms of, you know, the, the specific type of surfactant we buy and, and how we develop alternatives and all this stuff. So I got to know them very well got to learn about surfactants from talking to sales guys from, um, and I remember one company in particular called Beryl, which again, I don't think exists anymore. I think ultimately that business ended up as, as um, you know, part of AXO, which is now mm. Nurion, right? right? But Beryl had a sales office there in Manchester and the sales guy there would come in regularly and we'd just riff about surfactants for hours on end. 
And, and, and that was, you know, to me, that was the first time I truly appreciated the magic of surfactants as a user. And then it was, it was a little later. So it was really the early nineties then. Um, so around 10 years later that I truly got into the business of surfactants, you know, working uh, with uh, Pilot Chemical, um, right. uh, the privately owned manufacturer of surfactants and, and then moving on through various other, other companies, as you mentioned, that I, I started to be involved from a, a, a production and, and development point of view. And, you know, that, that's that same magic that I realized back then. I mean, it just every day it's, it's cemented in place, you know, and, and, and the critical role when you look at the role surfactants play in the basics of civilization, right? You know, health, wellness, cleanliness, um, the food chain, agriculture, energy, transportation, you know, and it's usually the little bits. I mean, there's more in a laundry detergent, obviously. Right. It's often just little bits that have a huge impact um, that, you know, I, I, it still amazes me, actually. It when is. I'm talking about it, I still think, wow, that's, you know, it's, it's just amazing. It is amazing. And I think it's an area, I think like many chemical products, people don't, the general public don't recognize how they interact and engage with these products on a daily basis. And I myself, when when I've worked in the surfactants business, for instance, would just say, okay, you know, it's the soapy stuff, which is a, yeah. which is a real simplification, but it, to the common person, I'm like, okay, that's what's making your laundry detergent work. That's what's making your dish liquids work and all these other wide variety of applications. So, so you've been in the industry for a while. What's different today versus when you started? Right. There's one thing that is different and the, uh economically, I would say, and that's uh, volatility. Um, when you look at some simple measures of volatility going back to the 80s and 90s, 80s and early 90s, or in fact, most of the 90s, you, know, you look at things like the, the price of crude oil and natural gas, and even vegetable oils like palm oil, as palm oil became more important in the surfactant supply chain. Right. The volatility in those prices in the 80s and 90s was nowhere near as high as what it is today. Hmm. And you can take a look at any graph, of just the crude oil price. You see 80s and 90s, you know, price would vary a little bit. And, and I think those of us in the industry at the time thought that was quite volatile. Now, you didn't see volatility really until the mid 2000s and especially kicking in like 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And right. since then, the, the volatility has not returned to the levels that it was in, in the 80s and 90s. And so the impact on the supply chain is pretty obvious. You know, you look at the basic building blocks like for, for surfactants, like ethylene, benzene, normal paraffins, et cetera, you know, that, that ripple their way through the supply chain into LAS and alcohols and alcohol sulfates. Um, that, that volatility in, in the crude oil and natural gas is, is reflected all the way down the supply chain. And so, you know, the, the role of uh, purchasing in particular and, and things like um, price stability and, and contracts and price firmness and all that stuff, radically different today than it was, uh, you know, 30 years ago. And so, it, you know, I, this is a little bit, what's the word, counterintuitive, you know, when, when, when you get to, I won't get us, I'm not going to say my age, I'm going to say my level of experience, you know, it's <laughs> traditional to say, oh, you know, kids today, they have it so much easier than we had it, you know, uh, when we were starting out. That's not true in the surfactants industry. I think today it's more challenging because of that volatility. And, you know, the other thing, the other factor in there that's associated with volatility is, um, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, it was a conventional wisdom and largely true that you could diversify your risk by looking to oleochemical and petrochemical sources. Right. You could reasonably assume that there wasn't a high degree of correlation between palm kernel oil, for example, and crude oil. And, and so you could, you could lay off some risk by having a, a balanced portfolio in your supply chain. And in fact, I've, I've done the analysis and, and, and that is absolutely true. Those two commodities were, were not significantly correlated up until again, you know, the mid 2000s, 2007, especially 2008. And then 
they kind of lock together a lot more. And there's a hmm. much higher degree of correlation since that period. So you've got higher volatility and more correlation between previously uncorrelated arms of the supply chain. So that makes it also, um, you know, additionally challenging. Yeah, and, absolutely. And me, you know, as I look at a business, if you're a business person in this area today, you're dealing with things that really we didn't think about that much back in those early days. Is this about though, is what's kind of driving this? And, and I think that correlation aspect is interesting as well, but is some of this about uh, market sophistication? Is it driven by transparency, um, right? So if I think about just markets in general, we have so much more data and transparency than we did 30 or 40 years ago. Um, or is there yeah. some other fundamental shift that's taken place? I think, no, I think you're right. I think data and transparency makes a big difference. I think speed of communication makes a big difference. That's huge. Uh, and, you know, price information can travel around the world instantly today, whereas, uh, you know, pr prior to the advent of, of the internet, it would have taken a few days, perhaps. And that makes a right. huge amount of difference. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that does, that does contribute to, to volatility for sure. Um, the, the, the correlation between Olio and Petro sides of the value chain, you know, as far as I can see that the, the major cause of that is probably the uh, growth in biofuels, biodiesel mm. based on palm oil in Southeast Asia and based on um, other vegetable oils like soy in um, uh, North America and Western Europe, you know, with the increasing use of those vegetable feedstocks in fuel, then fuel becomes the kind of the price benchmark between uh, crude oil, natural gas, and vegetable oils, and 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 you'll 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 see again. It's very coincident that as they start moving together, uh, that's that's the time in which biodiesel subsidies took off, and increasing right. amounts of these feedstocks were diverted into biodiesel in those in those markets. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of an. Uh structurally in some ways artificially linked, but definitely now it's become a structural linkage between the fuel markets from the bio basis into Unintended uh, traditional. Unintended consequ consequence nonetheless. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's turn the tides here a little bit. So you have been uh, an, an entrepreneur for a long time, right? So you started up companies and in, in divisions for VVF and for Occitano and then more recently, you have launched P2 Science, which I got to be honest, I did not realize that P2 Science had its roots since 2011. Yep. I thought it was a much newer company. So, yep. you know, tell us about P2 Science. What's the origin story there? Sure. We, we, were, we were somewhat under the radar. I would say substantially under the radar in the early days. So I think your perception is, is correct in terms of what we've been doing. But yes, we did get started way back, uh, almost 10 years ago now. And the origin story is pretty interesting. I was invited to speak at the American Chemical Society Green Chemistry Institute meeting. They've been having one every year for 20 odd years. It's, it's a pretty well established um, green chemistry meeting in Washington, DC, uh, very well attended. And so I was invited to come and talk about, guess what, surfactants, right? Because it's the only thing I know how to talk about or was back then. And, um, you know, the use of um, <clears throat> renewable chemistry in the surfactant supply chain. So right. I said, fine, I'll, yeah, I'll talk. Yeah, it sounds interesting. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the time got nearer, it was in June. And I'm thinking, ah, I don't want to go down there, Washington, DC, there's nothing else, you know, I'm just going to go and I'm going to make this talk. And there's a bunch of academics. And because it was, I mean, it's a lot of academics there, a lot of students. It's, you know, but of course, I had agreed to go. So I, I right. went, obviously. And, you know, I talked about surfactants and um, people seemed to be pretty interested in what I was saying. Right after I finished speaking, a gentleman came up to me. Uh, introduced himself and said, you know, there's some very interesting research going on at Yale University at the lab of Professor Paul Anastas. And you might want to come up and talk to these guys because there's potentially some relevance to surfactants. And, and you know, he, he got me interested and said, okay, fine. Uh, I, you know, uh, why not? It sounds interesting. Um, sure. This person was an investor, a venture investor. Okay. Um, Rob Bettigold is a managing partner at Elm Street Ventures. 
And, um, and so, you know, he piqued my interest. Um, and the name Paul Anastas actually was not familiar to me. Okay. <laughs> Although he, he seemed to imply this guy was pretty well known. I said, okay, well, he's well known, but I haven't heard of him. Nonetheless, I'm going to go up to Yale. I think and every researcher and professor often thinks they're well known. <laughs> right. Well, yes. Yeah. But, you know, and, and I mean, universe, yeah. he's incredibly well known in, in the chemical yeah. industry uh, for green chemistry. It honestly wasn't something I'd focused on up until that right. point. Funny thing is, later on that day, you know, I gave my talk in the morning. Um, we had a lunch, lunch uh, session, seminar. Um, and he was the keynote speaker at lunch, Paul Anastas. Ah, that's perfect. So he gets up on stage. And, and again, a lot of students in the room. I, I swear he was greeted like a rock star. And I'm thinking, wow. And he was a really good speaker. To, on top of that, I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. And there's this young lady sitting next to me, a student from George Washington University. And, and you know, we're listening to him speak. And she just turns to me and she says, wow, he's great, isn't he? I'm thinking, yeah, he's pretty good. You know, he's, he's, he's extolling the virtues of green chemistry. He's got this crowd eaten out of his hands. So I'm thinking, wow, now I'm really keen to meet this guy. So, sure. you know, a month later, I went up to Yale. We got talking, kicked around some ideas, met uh, Patrick Foley, his PhD student. And, um, and we brought in Rob Bedigal, the guy that introduced himself to me after the, the talk and figured out a, a, a financing arrangement to get the company off the ground. And we got into a lab in uh, December of, of that year and uh, wow. started working away. So, so the lesson, never pass up a speaking engagement, you know, um, because you just never know what's going to come out of it. Absolutely. It sounds like a bit of serendipity. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, so definitely. tell us more about P2 science today. So from your, your, journey back in 2011, uh, kind of a chance meeting to yep. 10 years later, you guys are obviously, um, I, I see a lot about you, um, a lot of products being developed and promoted. Tell us, you know, tell us where you are today. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, today we're a manufacturing company um, with products and customers and sales, a plant in Connecticut. Oh, we've got two locations in Connecticut. Our manufacturing plant is in Naugatuck, and our research lab and headquarters are in Woodbridge. Woodbridge is okay. right next door to New Haven, and Naugatuck's about 20 minutes drive away. And so, you know, we're focusing on two markets, cosmetics and personal care is one, and fragrances, selling aroma chemicals into the fragrance uh, industry, that's, that's the other. And we've got yeah. two, two major platform technologies, uh, ozonolysis and continuous etherification. And so, you know, we've, we've grown quite a bit. The early, early years were, I'd like to say, somewhat in stealth mode. You'll hear people talk about we're in stealth mode. And I suppose we were because we really didn't talk much outside of the company. We were focused on developing the technology and talking with individual customers. We were very focused in our marketing in those early years. We'd go and we'd talk to the top five fragrance companies. Hmm. That's where most of the business and most of the innovation is. Sure. And we talked to the top, you know, five, five or six really cosmetics and care, personal care companies and, and work very much one on one on idea generation and product development. It was really only um, after we built our plant, which uh, was in 2018, that we started to get a little bit more involved in merchant marketing, right? Marketing to, to the, you know, the broad market. Got it. And, and really, strictly speaking, we, we haven't developed a, a true sort of catalog of products until the middle of last year, April, in fact, of, of 2020, was when we introduced to the, the world as a whole our Citropol range of cosmetics ingredients. So, yeah, the, the sort of the public activity has, has really taken off yeah. just in the last year or two. So when did you know that you had a commercially viable product and a commercially viable business? Well, there's two ways of knowing um, as I think about this. One is I, I just knew at the very beginning um, because I knew that after the rock star reception that Paul Anastas got 
uh, that green chemistry wasn't a fringe thing anymore. Right. This is, you know, this is back in 2011 where you could argue it, it, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I knew it wasn't. It wasn't a fringe thing. It was becoming mainstream. So that said to me, yeah, this is, this is a real thing now. Um, it's not just for the odd brand here and there. And uh, the technology that we were working on in the, the very earliest days in 2011, 2012, yeah. I knew it had enormous potential. I knew it was patentable, even though we hadn't gotten the patents yet. Right. Um, so that's one level of knowing, which, you know, you'd say is probably the natural sort of self-confidence of an, of an entrepreneur, right? When I really knew that I knew was when BASF invested in the company in 2017. That to me was not just a great financial investment, but a validation from the world's largest chemical company that, hey, you know, we're not just drinking our own Kool-Aid here, that we really have something because BASF thinks we have something, right? That's Pretty nice. Simple. Yeah, and absolutely. That, that was an absolute confirmation that our technology was world-class and, you know, um, we weren't, you know, was, having that external validation um, is, is always helpful. And right. so from that point, yeah, we, know, we never look back. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, you guys are obviously uh, working on a lot of innovation. What's been your approach, right? So when you think about the approach to innovation, does it start with the product, which maybe it sounds like perhaps it has, or does it start really with the market? How do you see innovation in this space? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, for me, it starts with the market actually. And, but, but even more than that, it starts with um, individual customers, right? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure, you get a sense of what the market is looking for. And, and you know, we obviously had ideas about technology uh, and things that we could do before we even talked to anyone. But talking to individual customers at, a, at a, a high enough level, you know, talking to folks at these companies who are driving R&D strategy, for example, mm -hmm. technology strategy, that's really, for me, where, um, where, where things get created. Um, it's, it's between those, the, those human beings um, sitting on opposite sides of the table. And, and, you know, we take the results of those conversations go back to the lab and say, all right, you know, let's see if we can make that happen. What he, what he said during that meeting or what, what, he, what he wished would happen or, you know, whatever the, 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 whatever the thing was that you talked about and, and, then, and then go back and make it an iterative process. That for us, I mean, I'm, I mean, that doesn't pro probably doesn't work for everybody, but that's been our, our approach. We were very early, even though we were in so-called stealth mode, we were very, very early getting out and talking to, as I said, the top five fragrance companies before we had, well, we had a lab, we had a lab very early on, but yeah. before we had anything else, we were talking at a, in depth at a very high level to, to these companies. And, and that, I think, fueled a lot of the innovation that we brought to market. Nice. That's important. That's important. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so PT Science is a green or renewable company, renewable chemistry, which has been really a, around for a long time. It is certainly a hot topic. One of the key trends across the chemical industry is around green and renewable and circularity and sustainable and all yeah. those things. And yet when we think about green chemistry, it's often very small batch oriented, right? So compared to uh, competitive technologies um, and often doesn't necessarily seem to be able to meet what really the market requires. Like, so the market seems to be asking for more green and renewable. So is this actually scalable? When does green chemistry become a real core part of the whole value chain? Yeah, I, you know, I, you sent me that question, and I, 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 I'm not sure I agree with the premise necessarily. Okay. Um, in that, um, in that um, you know, we're, we're, we, we in particular, you know, we're not actually operating any batch processes. We're, we're okay. really, we're really into continuous flow chemistry. We love process intensification um, because it's, uh, it's a green chemistry principle. It, it lowers energy intensity, footprint, waste. 
increases efficiency. So we love flow chemistry. Um, but, um, you know, I think that uh, we're past the point where um, green chemistry has to be a niche specialty. Um, if you, you, you go back to, let's say, the mid 2000s, companies like Solazyme and Elevance and uh, a few of the others, you know, they, they came, Amaris, who are still going, uh, they, they came to the market targeting diesel. They were going to be the next uh, diesel or the next gasoline. So not exactly, a, not exactly a small volume niche specialty. Now they failed, right? Obviously, you know, Solazyme doesn't exist anymore. Amaris has pivoted into other markets. So I think it was a little, a little ambitious to go after one of the most high volume, super efficient markets like fuel that you could imagine. And so they, they backed off and, and went more into specialties. And in fact, Amaris is a quite, quite active and reasonably uh, successful in aroma chemicals today. So it's a big switch from uh, diesel to uh, fragrance compounds, you know, opposite Absolutely. End industry, <laughs> um, process industry. So, um, you know, starting, starting in uh, small volume specialties is a smart move for any new technology. And, sure. and certainly, you know, part of our thinking of, of going into aroma chemicals was exactly that. You can be, you could be meaningful and respectable with a relatively small plant um, with relatively small investment, all helpful from the point of view of a venture-backed startup, um, and you know enables us to get a toehold, uh, get some commercial activity, and and grow from there. But as I said, you know in our case in particular, we're operating continuous chemical processes. So one of our future target markets, which we've talked about in in a couple of press releases, is renewable um, polyesters and polyamides where we can okay. deploy our core um, continuous ozonolysis process, which we use to make fragrances today. We can deploy that process on a much larger scale. It's essentially the same plant, um, just uh, it, we run a series of parallel tubes. And so we'll, we'll put more tubes in the bundle to get greater throughput. So it's essentially the same plant on a much larger scale to produce monomers for polyamides and polyesters, which is, tens and hundreds of thousands of tons per year, rather than just the hundreds of tons that we're, we're um, using for uh, fragrances. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, a pretty significant step. We're working on this with ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, as our partner in this, you know, that they're bringing obviously to the uh, supply chain, significant capability in vegetable oils. Right. And so, yeah, I think it takes, I think, you know, the new technology takes time. I'd, I'd say within the past year, um, certain public commitments, uh, for example, and particularly the one by Unilever, where they're saying they're going to they're going to eliminate their dependence on I think they call it fossil fuel derived uh, inputs uh, to their products by 2030. I mean that's a huge deal, right? That's that's, that's significant, all, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's massive. That's all the LAS, right? All the alpha olefins. I'm just thinking in surfactant terms now. Yeah. That's, that's big time. That is not niche specialty anymore. And 2030 mm -hmm. is, um, you know, less than nine years time. Is, so. is the industry ready for it? I mean, what do you see? You, you're pretty in touch with a wide variety of companies. Or, you know, it sounds like your, your product is scalable. You think your technology is scalable, yep. but is, is the rest of the industry ready for that? I think I think Unilever could do it um, with uh, with the right approach and the right partnerships with the industry. Yeah. Um, I am, unless this is going to turn out to be like the a business school case study of the worst sort of public relations disaster. I'm pretty sure they know they can do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so so vocal about this. I mean, I remember when the um, when the announcement came out, right? I think it was like last summer, maybe towards the end of the summer. Yeah. And I got a call from a uh, reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and she says, "You know, what is what? What's the deal here? Are they actually using like fossil fuels in their products?" I said, "Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They're using petrochemicals in all of their products. Forget about the packaging. I mean, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. There's a lot of." You know, petrochemicals in their packaging, but even in the products, of course, there's a lot. So she says, this is a meaningful thing. I said, yeah, it's meaningful. They're not just, you know, it's not greenwashing, so to speak. This is a right. big deal. 
because they use a lot of this stuff already. And uh, to make that sort of transformation in 10 years, yeah, it's significant. So you, right. yeah, is wondering if like this is a real story and, and, you know, or something to take seriously. So, yeah, I think I, and I think it's possible. I think it's doable. I think they'll do it. Um, the, uh, you know, the, now, is it a good idea? I mean, I think it's good for them. I think they have a, um, you know, it's part of their identity with respect to renewable right. uh, products in general, you know, environmental responsibility. I think it's good for them. Um, I, I don't know if it's good for the whole industry, but hey, I mean, that's great, you know, right? That's capitalism. That's the competitive market. I, I think, you know, I, I really wish them a lot of success. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Neil, you've been leading uh, new businesses and startups for more than a decade. Here you are, you know, growing P2 Science. What have you found from a leadership perspective to be the most critical elements in developing a new business and growing your business and your team? Right. Good question. So, yeah, we, I mean, a lot of what we've done at P2 and, and prior to that is creating something out of nothing. And um, I think it goes back to what we were talking about um, with respect to how, how we grew P2 and how we you know decided what to innovate. It's that interaction between you as the company and, and the customer, but it's more fundamentally about sort of human interaction um, and it may be a bit of a cliche, but you know, it's 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 really only humans that create things. You know, without humans, nothing, not not obviously, <laughs> uh, not, not nothing about civilization would be would be created. And so, you know, I, I think to create something out of nothing, you 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 can have an idea uh, on your own, right? Sitting in, right. I have an idea sitting here in my study or my partners can have an idea sitting in there and, you know, working in the lab, but to, to actually make something happen, you know, someone else has to be involved, usually a customer, sometimes a partner or a supplier. And, and, you know, it's that, that human connection and personal interaction that, you know, and cooperation between humans that, that enables all of this stuff to happen, all this incredible innovation that we're doing and, you know, and, and the industry's doing. So that's, that's the most important thing. And, and, um, you know, I've tried to, what one of our, you know, we have a mission, vision and values like, like most companies. And um, right. uh, one of our values is, is respect. And I talk about this a lot and it's a little bit different to, to maybe what people may originally think in that what, what I like to stress is that we, we went in the course of our business, um, we have to respect each other as human beings, not just inside the company and not just customers, but suppliers as well, you know, uh, people that interact with our company in any way. And the example I give is when I first started in sales, um, which was uh, also the early 80s, I guess. <laughs> A lot of stuff <laughs> happened in the 80s. But um, when I first started in sales, I was in export sales and this was pre-internet. And so you'd be selling stuff to people halfway around the world. We had customers in Australia and China and, you know, wherever, Japan, sure. Europe, obviously. And, you know, here, here's what, here were cu customers, many of them family owned uh, or, you know, even one man or two man type of distributors. And they were depending on you to get you, to get them your, your, your product, um, a month on the sea, you know, clear it through customs. The right. only means of communication was was telex back in those. I'm sounding like an ancient guy here, but anyway, <laughs> uh, maybe you can edit all this out. But <laughs> but you know, I, I I always used to think of these these guys at the other end of the supply chain, many of whom I'd, I hadn't only communicated with via telex. Right, they're like they're waiting for the product to arrive. They put a huge amount of cash down, either they paid in advance or they've opened a letter of credit, which means they have to put the money in the bank. So either way, they put up all this money and they're waiting and they're going to turn that money that they put up, you know, around and make a profit on it and then, you know, feed their family. And I'm thinking, what, what, what would I feel like? I'm sitting around halfway around the world. You know, I'm worried. All right. I'm concerned yeah. about this. And so, you know, you've got to have that human empathy to, to understand what they're going through and, and be, you know, and, and 
things go wrong, you tell them, hey, you know, it's been delayed. This is why it's been delayed. Or, you know, it's not on this vessel, it's on this other vessel. But don't worry, it's getting there at the same time. You know, just have that. I mean, there's kind of the basic business sense, right? But there's also, I think, if you remember, there's a human being at the other end of the interaction. Yeah, I think you'll just be that much better at what you're doing, you know? And so, you know, I took that lesson from back then and I applied to everything. You know, you're having a discussion on a technical matter or a financial matter or, a, you know, an investment matter with an opposite number in another company. You have to remember it's a human being and, and you yeah. know, they're at least as weird as you are. And, and you're probably have your weird <laughs> idiosyncrasy. So, you know, and, and just absolutely just mind, yeah. right and that's yeah, yeah. That, that's a long-winded answer but I think I think that kind of runs through everything I, I do you know yeah I think that's actually a, a, a great point it's all business is human and we have to and it's personal right even yeah. when it's not personal it's personal to the individual and if you can keep that in mind and uh, I I'm similar I believe that you know everybody wants to be successful in what they're doing right? And their definition of success might be a little bit different than yours, but you have to understand how do you help them be successful? Because individuals, we do crave success. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. A lot of things, success, respect, recognition, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it, 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 but you know, that, otherwise nothing would happen you That's know, right. without people cooperating. So Absolutely. that's not cooperative element is is it just it gets reaffirmed every single day for me no doubt so neil when you are not uh leading the charge at p2 science and helping icis uh organize surfactants conferences and training you know what do you do for fun do you actually have free time with everything that's going on (laughs) well you know before the pandemic hit i used to sing in a choir right oh Uh, interesting yeah, yeah, we, 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 we were pretty active. Um, but, you know, since since good old COVID happened, we have not gotten together because, uh, you know, singing in a small space is about the worst possible thing you could do. Indeed. Uh, so, but that was great. You know, I, I really enjoyed uh, singing. We, we did a lot of cool stuff from like the... Uh, earliest days of the church all the way to contemporary music, um, a lot of polyphonic stuff. And um, actually, we, with the, f- the first time we will be together for over a year is going to be on Memorial Day, where we're getting together to sing outside at a Memorial Day ceremony in the center of town. Very nice. So I'm really looking forward to that. That'll be awesome. We'll, we'll probably sound awful because, you know, most of us haven't sung for over a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just admit it. We know you're singing in the shower in your backyard or wherever the case yeah, may be. Yeah, that's maybe. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good. Neil, this has been delightful. Um, I really appreciate you taking uh, the time to speak with us. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they learn more about P2 Science? Where can they get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah, well, our website is reasonably informative, p2science.com. Um, so please check it out. So you want to get in touch with me, neil at p2science.com. Very easy. Um, you know, follow us on, on LinkedIn. We're also on Instagram. We're a little more active on Instagram now because we have a marketing person just joined the company in uh, January. Fabulous. Um, uh, so yeah, check us out there. And we have a YouTube channel as well, which we're loading up uh, additional content on. So certainly uh, feel, feel free to check us out there. Awesome. Well, Neil, this has been great. I uh, appreciate it. And I hope uh, you have a great day. And I um, hope everybody's enjoyed listening to this episode of The Chemical Show. You're very welcome, Victoria. Much success with this thing. I think it's going to do great. Thank you. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.